Hey guys, you ever wonder where Mario came from? If not, you either watch a lot of game history or you watch a ton of this channel as we've kind of covered at least in part, but someone was asking for more of a deep dive of the character. His first appearance, design, why and how he became so popular, and I thought, you know, I really and truly have not done much outside his original appearance, and mostly assumed he became popular because of how pervasive that Super Mario Bros. was on the original NES console. So I decided to do some digging and, well, if you know me by now, you know that if you're seeing this video on my channel that I found a bit more than I bargained for, even if some of it played out as I thought it did. So if you have some time, dig a bit into the plucky plumber, his history and influence, not only for most of our childhoods, but for mascots in general. Let's go! Now, like many stories from the early days of gaming, the history of Mario started with, well, a mistake. Yep, you heard me, a mistake. You see, Nintendo was early into the video game business and had had some success with games like AVR Race and Radar Scope in Japan, which did really well. Nintendo, sensing they had more of a global success on their hands, made 3,000 Radar Scope units to distribute in the United States. The problem is, the American arcade operators found it too close to Space Invaders, along with certain noise complaints about the noises that the game made as well. This left Nintendo, in particular Yamauchi, the head of Nintendo, with a problem. 2,000 unsold radar scope cabinets. It was then that he went to a young Miyamoto, who was a producer and artist, to find a use for these cabinets. The upside to asking Miyamoto around this time is that he really wasn't much of a programmer at the time. He was more story and design focused. As Nintendo wanted to get into the American market, he began looking at American cartoons. In particular, Popeye. His first thought was to make a licensed game involving Popeye, trying to save Olive Oil from Pluto. However, like many games around this time, the license didn't really come in soon enough to use it. So they adjusted, adapting Pluto into Donkey Kong, Popeye into Jumpman, and Olive Oil became the Lady, also known as Pauline. If you're thinking to yourself at this point, this sounds a lot like King Kong, well, you're not the only one. In 1982, after Nintendo had released the game in the arcade, the game of watch, and even license it to ColecoVision, Universal City Studios, also known as Universal Studios, took notice, dragging Nintendo into a legal battle over the character himself. This almost killed off our plucky plumber's future before he could ever flourish into what we know of him today. Thankfully for all of us, the courts found in Nintendo's favor, and we got multiple sequels, one of which was Donkey Kong Jr. You see, Miyamoto had originally wanted to use Donkey Kong for the main protagonist around this time. However, the character's size was too big and bulky with the hardware to officially move him around on the screen well. So they came up with a new concept, Donkey Kong's son. In this game, Donkey Kong Jr. would risk everything to save his father from, father from Mario. Yep, you heard me right. This was the first time the name Mario was actually used. The name itself was rumored to come out of Nintendo of America. The story goes that while a group of them were working, their landlord came in, who's named Wario, barging in and demanding the rent. So, particularly as a joke, they decided to name Jumpman and rename him Mario after their landlord. In this game, Mario had caged up Donkey Kong after their first encounter. This would be the one and only time that Mario would play the villain in a video game. Kinda cool, huh? It wouldn't take too long after this, though, that Mario would find his way into his own game, Mario Bros. Now, Mario Brothers was created by Shigure Miyamoto and Gumbai Yokyo. Yep, the same one responsible for Metroid, Game Boy, and the Virtual Boy. Look, we all make mistakes, okay? The game had various different platforms that Mario could jump on with pipes on the sides that would allow enemies to kind of move around the screen effectively. Seeing the design, Game Boy suggested eliminating enemies by hitting them from below. This actually is what gave them the idea for Turtles. The thought was that they would only be vulnerable from below, so you'd have to flip them over in order to be able to finish them off. Upon playing this, they found out that it was a little too easy, so they made a slight change. Hitting enemies once from underneath would flip them over, like we were talking about before. Touching them again would eliminate them from play. Miyamoto also decided to change Mario's profession from a carpenter to a plumber around this time to better fit with the setting change to the location in New York. Due to the network of pipes, 
imagining it kind of like a network of sewer pipes under the city. He also colored the pipes green to keep the game more bright and colorful, creating a lot of what we had seen in future games to come. On top of that, they also introduced Mario's brother Luigi here, so that two players could play the game at the same time, making him a simple palette swap of our main hero, Mario. The game was well received overall, making it into multiple systems, including but not limited to the Atari 2600, 5200, ZX Spectrum, Famicom, and NES. It even had a moderate amount of success in the arcade, but that would pale in comparison to what was to come later on down the road. In 1985, Nintendo would start making a hard push at trying to get their popular Famicom console to take off in the United States, offering multiple different SKUs for the system for consumers at various different price levels. Most of them included some form of Super Mario Bros., which was one of Nintendo's latest games involving our plumber hero and his brother. This game, in many ways, started to make Mario a household name, for a few reasons. Its accessibility is almost everyone had the cartridge, so much so, one of the rare NES cartridges is actually the standalone Super Mario Bros. cart that wasn't combined with other games like Duck Hunt. On top of that, the gameplay was an eye-opener for the time. While not revolutionary in this space, it took many other concepts from other games that had been done before and put them together in one of the cleanest package anyone had ever seen before, in many ways making the blueprint for the platformer genre that would dominate much of the console market from its launch through most of the 1990s, quite frankly. This wouldn't be the only reason that Mario became such a household name, though. Nintendo wouldn't have him make guest appearances in tons of their earlier games. He would be the main character in Golf for the NES, your main protagonist in Wrecking Crew. Heck, he would even be a referee in Punch-Out! He would show up in spin-off games like Dr. Mario and other titles as well. He would even have plushies, toys, and other collectibles. He started to get so popular that he even had his own cartoon show in the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. It was a short-lived cartoon with roughly 65 episodes. Sorry, sometimes I actually forget how much like Sweatshop's early cartoon development was. It's, it's insane. A cartoon could have two seasons and end up with 100 episodes or more. It was just ridiculous. This show would actually start to highlight more of Nintendo's franchise characters like Zelda, Link, and even showing Peach more often. This wouldn't be the only way that the plumber would pull other characters into the limelight, though. Soon after Super Mario Bros. came out, Japan actually started working on a sequel. The trouble is that Nintendo of America actually found the sequel a bit too much like the original, and too hard for the American audience. Nintendo hearing this went back to the drawing board and pulled a lesser-known title that they had previously only released on the Famicom known as Doki Doki Panic. They then started to reskin this particular game. Now, this had a few benefits. One of which is it made Peach, Luigi, and Toad playable for the first time. On top of that, they made them distinct in their own way. Mario was the balanced character, Luigi was now taller and had his own look, and in addition to that, he could actually now jump higher than Mario. Peach could float over long distances, and Toad was the strongest of the four and able to pull up items faster than any of the other characters. Now, this was actually likely a holdover of the original game, but it did help flesh out each one of the characters in a new and interesting way. This trend would continue with the Mario franchise in many ways. It would innovate platforming and add more and more lovable characters to its world. It started becoming so popular that Hollywood actually started to take notice with movies like The Wizard coming out, showcasing Super Mario Bros. 3 into the American market before its release in 1990. Later on, they would also come out with Super Mario Bros. the movie in 1993, during the peak of Mario and Nintendo's power, with everyone frantically trying to come out with their own mascots like Sonic and Gex, to name a few. And a few years later, when the PlayStation released, we'd get Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon. In a way, Nintendo sparked much of the mascot craze of the 1990s. Nintendo has continued to use Mario as an ambassador and as a mascot putting him in game after game to the point that he's now pushing over 200 titles that he's either mainlined in or starred in over the years. Starting as a happy accident, proceeding to push the brand forward, becoming in many ways more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. In no small part due to the love that Nintendo's continued to lavish on their lovable carpenter, turned plumber, turned doctor, and any number of other jobs. Over the years, they've actually begun to lavish more of that love on other characters, 
with Luigi busting ghosts and even Princess Peach starring in a number of games as her own lead. Even Donkey Kong over the years has come into his own, and Nintendo is getting more and more into movies again with Detective Pikachu and with the most recent release of the Super Mario Bros. movie that made $1.36 billion, showing that Nintendo's faith and attention to its legacy and its characters has paid off big time. However, what do you guys think of Mario and the games he's been in over the years? Are any of you fans of Nintendo or Mario? Do you prefer other mascot characters? Do you hate mascot characters and are glad that they're mostly gone at this point? Heck, what do you think of Nintendo's movies and merchandise? Do you have any favorites? Let me know in the comments. And while you're there, if you don't mind, please leave this video a like. And if you see more of my content you like, possibly one of the videos on the screen now, consider following the channel. That actually helps me out a ton. And I also hope you've enjoyed your stay and learned something today. Till we meet again though, have a great rest of your day and happy gaming.